Good morning. It's good to be here this morning. There's some folks visiting with us today, and we're glad that you are here. I'm sure there's some visiting for the holidays, and I know your families are glad that you're here. I'm glad you've taken time to visit with them. I hope that it's been an enjoyable weekend for many of you who have been able to visit with family and been able to enjoy an Ohio State victory. Um, it's good to be here this morning. It's good to be here to worship God. It's good to sing praises to Him, to offer prayer. And I hope that this time that we have together to study His Word and to think about Him and what He teaches us will be beneficial for you too. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. We're going to take our time studying the first chapter of Samuel and thinking about Hannah. Thinking about Hannah. You know, this story means a lot to me. Um, <clears throat> when my wife first, first became pregnant, we, we lost our first child. She miscarried. And it was a sad time in our lives. Many of you understand that, and some of you have been through that. And we prayed. And we prayed hard. And very soon thereafter, she was pregnant again with another child, and we named that child Samuel. Very much after this story, Hannah, because for this child we had prayed, and we prayed that, that we would have a child, and, and so we named him after this, this story in the Bible. It meant, meant a lot to us, means a lot to us, and when I think of my son Samuel, I think about how hard we prayed for that boy, and how God answered our prayers, and how thankful we were that he did that. Our theme for this quarter is focused on striving together, side by side, in worship. And perhaps no act of worship is spoken of more in the scriptures than prayer. There are biblical examples throughout the scriptures, and we could choose a variety of them, many of them. There are many examples of the godly people who went to the Lord in prayer all throughout scripture. There are plenty of commands about it. Jesus spent time in his Sermon on the Mount focused on prayer, an acceptable prayer to him. Paul once said, pray without ceasing. The example of Jesus was that it was his custom to take a break away from the crowds and spend some time alone on the mountain in prayer. The example, when, when the early church was suffering, when Peter and John were in prison, they were praying and the church was praying for them. Whenever there was a trial, whenever there was a difficulty, we see the church in prayer. We see elders given the responsibility to pray for those who are sick in James 5. We see individuals called to pray when circumstances arise where they need to go to the Lord in prayer. And, and Paul really in 1 Timothy 2 says that we should offer intercessions, we should offer petitions, we should offer giving of things for all people and pray that all people might be saved uh, by God who sent our Savior to this earth. And so prayer is certainly something that we need to take some time on. If we're going to have a series on worship, we're, we're going to be focused on that. We need to take some time to think about prayer. And I want to think about the mother of Samuel, Hannah, and her persistent prayerfulness. Let me read to you, if you will, the first couple of, first few verses here from 1 Samuel chapter 1. It says, There was a certain man of Ramatham Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim, his name was Elkanah, the son of Jerom, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohi, the son of Zuth, and Ephraimite. And he had two wives. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, the name of the other Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Benina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. Now think about that for a moment. He would give portions to Benina, his wife, and to all of her sons and daughters. Imagine Hannah sitting there. While portions were given to Penina, while portions were given to all of her children, sitting there while all of these portions were given out, and Hannah, having no children, is giving one portion, but she's given a double portion. 
Imagine the sadness that here you are watching all of Panay and his children be blessed with their portion, with their offering, and yet here you are alone and it's just you. And you have no other children. This was a situation that hurt Hannah's feelings. Have you ever been in that situation? In a situation, not, hopefully you haven't been in the situation where in a polygamous marriage. Somebody said yes. Hopefully you haven't been exactly in that situation. But have you ever been in a situation where some, somebody was being blessed with something that you wanted so badly, but you couldn't have it? And so you were a little bit jealous. You were a little bit hurt by that. And that's the situation that Hannah was in. Hannah, it says, he would give her a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely. So not only was it the situation where Hannah knew she so far was childless and was unable to have children up to this point, but her rival, this is a, a good reason why polygamous marriage is a problem, because it creates a rivalry situation, creates a situation where we're jealousy, where... Um, one person perhaps is favored more than the other, or one other person is disfavored, another person is blessed more than the other, and it just creates a rivalry. And her rival provoked her severely to make her miserable. She, she wanted her to hurt more than she already did. Because the Lord had closed her womb. Some people are just mean. Some people are just inconsiderate. And Peniah was that. She was mean. She was purposely hurting her. And so it was. Here's how Hannah reacts. Year by year. This, this doesn't just happen once. This was something that had happened over a period of years. When she went up to the house of the Lord, that she provoked her and she wept and she could not eat. Have you ever been that sad, that distraught? She wept and she could not eat. I'm not hungry. I don't want to eat. I, you're so hurt. You're so distressed. And that's the situation that Hannah is in. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Elkanah's reaction is interesting. Sometimes we think that as husbands we can just fix it all by our own goodness and our own glory. You just can't fix everything, can you, husbands? You just can't. And Elkanah, doesn't matter how good he thought he was, didn't ease the hurt that Hannah was feeling. In fact, maybe it made it worse that he would even mention that. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, and Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she, this is Hannah, was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And she made a vow. And she said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. <clears throat> And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth and Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. And so Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. Now I want you to see that three times, three times Hannah has really been hurt by three different people. She's been hurt by Penina, who's provoking her because she can't have children, and, and she likes to rub it in as her rival. She's been hurt by Elkanah, who thinks and, and, and thoughtlessly doesn't consider the fact that, you know, Hannah is hurt here, and she just needs you to weep with her. She doesn't need you to rub it in or say, well, I should make everything better. And now she's been hurt by Eli, the priest, thinking that maybe here's this religious person who would understand Here's someone who would be understanding of my situation and sympathize with me and maybe offer to pray with me. And all he can say is, are you drunk? What are you crying for? Put your wine away from you. So she's hurt three straight times, but I also want you to see her reaction to it. Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. That's a very measured, that's a very reasonable, 
That's a very kind response considering what she's just been accused of. And Eli answered and said, go in peace and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate and her face was no longer sad. Well, consider for a moment Hannah's background and difficult situation that's really spelled out in these first few verses of 1 Samuel. Very basic story is this, that here's a woman who's childless, living in a culture where children were considered a blessing from God. And so to not have children makes her feel like perhaps she has been cursed by God. Certainly other people feel that way. She has no heir in the sense of a, of a male heir, although her rival does. She's childless and she's living in a polygamous marriage where the affection of her husband is split between two women, which is hurtful in and of itself and by itself. The other wife, Penina, sees her as a rival, provokes her on purpose, and Elkanah thinks he's good enough to make her happy. Aren't I as good to you as, as ten sons would be? You don't need any children. It's okay. You got me. To make matters worse, even the priest rebukes her while she is in tearful prayer. Now, how would you respond in such circumstances? You've got this woman, this, this other woman, who's provoking you. How would you respond to that? How do you respond to that? Would you perhaps find a way to get back at her? Find a group of your friends and really try to make her look bad to other people? How would you respond to a husband? who really says things that are pretty thoughtless. Post kind of some subtle things on your social media page, make everybody know what an idiot he is. That's how some people actually handle those situations. Vent about it to other people. Gossip about him, make him look bad. How would you handle a husband who says things that are thoughtless to you? Say things thoughtless back to him in return. To start a good old-fashioned quarrel and fight with each other. What about a religious person? What about a priest who says something to you as hurtful as, why are you crying while you're praying? You must be drunk. Can you imagine somebody saying that? We've heard prayers here. Have you ever in your mind thought that to yourself? What is he, what is he crying for? What is he getting tearful for? Friends, you're in the situation of Eli if you've thought that way. Hannah says, I'm pouring out my soul before the Lord. I'm not drunk at all. Don't even think that. How would you respond to someone who is accusing you of sin when you're truly being as passionate towards the Lord as you could possibly be? Some people would quit on the church, maybe give up, maybe say, I don't really appreciate what somebody said there to me, so I'm not going back there and being with those people. Maybe you go complain about it to a group of other people in the church so you can have a, just a little bit of start some strife with it. I want you to see how Hannah responded to all of these things. She prayed. She prayed. How do you handle your difficult circumstances? Your family strife that may have... Some of you may have had a great time with family this weekend. For other, for other people, sometimes getting together with family can be a stressful thing. How do you handle the family strife? How do you handle your health problems when you're facing those? Complain? Give up on God? How do you handle your disappointments? How do you handle your loneliness when you're facing those times? How do you handle your anger? How do you handle your depression? How do you handle your job problems? How do you handle your financial hardships when they come your way? How do you handle the problems and the pressures of life? Well, Hannah responded when provoked the way godly people should respond, she responded with prayer. When family provokes, when husbands do not understand, look at what she does in verse 10. She was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. When even religious folks misunderstand the situation, when they lack discernment about what's really going on in your life, Notice what she continues to do. Look at verse 12. As she continued praying before the Lord. She says in verse 15, again, a reference to prayer. I have poured out my soul 
before the Lord. She says in verse 16, out of the abundance of my complaint, did she have some real reasons to complain? Real reasons to be full of grief? But she says, I, have I am complaining before the Lord. I am bringing my grief to the Lord. I'm speaking to him. How many people would give up their faith? How many would lash out with their tongue, strike back when they're hurt, and yet we're told in Scripture, that's not going to do us any good. She is prayerful when she is provoked. James 1 and verse 19 says, My beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You responding to others who have hurt you in kind is not going to make you more righteous. It's not going to fix the situation. It says be swift to hear. Notice what we're called to do as New Testament Christians. And it's what we see the ex in the example of Hannah. She doesn't lose her, temple sh her temper. She doesn't lose sight of her God when provoked. She pours out her soul in prayer. And that's what we're called to do. Peter, as he writes to suffering Christians in 1 Peter 3, says the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So if you're suffering, he's encouraging them to pray. To pray. In chapter 5 and verse 6, as he concludes his letter again to people who may have been run out of towns, who are being reproached for the name of Christ, as we read the context of Peter, people who are suffering on account of their faith, he says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. In James 5, this is what James wrote, again, to Christians who are suffering, Christians who are struggling with doubt. The first chapter is focused on prayer, but the last chapter is too. He says, is anyone among you suffering? What's your response to your suffering? Let him pray. Look at verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray. Don't just try to handle it yourself. Ask others to go to the Lord in prayer for you. Verse 16, you're struggling with a sin problem. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. Ask someone to pray for you that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We're going to see that with Hannah in just a moment. But the example James uses is Elijah. He says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Isn't that comforting? Don't think of Elijah as some superhuman who's better than all of you. No, he's a man with a nature like ours. Elijah suffered. Elijah got discouraged. Elijah got depressed. Elijah hid out. Elijah sometimes had a pity party when he was suffering. Read 1 Kings chapter 19 and tell me, tell me otherwise. Elijah went through a variety of, of difficult circumstances and thus sometimes very sad emotions. And yet he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain. God answered his prayer, and God can answer ours. Here's what the Hebrew writer says. We do not have a high priest, speaking of Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Did Jesus suffer physically? He did so on the cross for you and for me. Did Jesus suffer emotionally? He talks in his own language. He says, my heart is grieved in going to the cross. Did Jesus suffer from loneliness? All of his disciples forsook him and fled and left him there to suffer alone. Did Jesus suffer? He suffered greater than perhaps anyone that we could ever think of, and, and innocently. Did he suffer from false accusations? Was he betrayed by friends? And yet we're told, go to Jesus because he can sympathize with our weaknesses. He was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So come boldly to the throne of grace. Jesus is on the throne waiting to hear your prayers. He is our advocate, ready and willing to respond to you. So we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Perhaps one of our greatest tests of faith is whether we are willing to lay our cares before God and seek the help of our Heavenly Father when we are in distress. I want to share with you before we pick up the story, a story from this weekend. 
this happens to me sometimes where it just feels like something that I'm about to preach preach on. There's just something that happens in my life that that is just so fitting for the topic that I'm about to, to preach about. Some of you who are here Wednesday night for, for Bible study, you heard me announce before Bible study that my brother and, and his wife, they just announced that they're over 20 weeks pregnant now, just last week. And they went Tuesday night and were there Wednesday morning to the hospital. She was having some complications. And the doctor came in Wednesday. I got a call around 5 o'clock. I got a call around 5 o'clock before I came to Bible study Wednesday night. And he said, Josh, <clears throat> it sounds like Nathaniel and Mandy are losing the baby. They were just told by a doctor that there's a 99, this is his words literally, 99.9% .9 chance you are going to lose your child. He said she was leaking amniotic fluid and and there were some other issues. And I thought, it's going to be a terrible Thanksgiving, right? Because they've been trying for three years to have a child. Here, this is going to happen. My mom's crying on the phone, calling me. My dad's crying. My brother, he's the emotional one, so I expect him to cry. But he's crying. Uh, well, how do you think they responded to that? They prayed. They prayed. And they prayed hard. And I prayed. And my family prayed. And my kids went to Bible class, and their Bible class teachers prayed Wednesday night. I get there. We drove to Indianapolis Wednesday night after Bible study and got there about midnight. In the morning, we were going to go to the hospital and, and visit her. She's on bed rest for the duration of the pregnancy. But I get a call about 10 o'clock in the morning, get a call at the house. And it's my brother. And he tells my mom, he said, somebody get over here and bring two dozen eggs. And, and I, my parents have chickens, by the way. So we get lots of eggs. And so my mom tells me, of course, well, you're in town. So go bring him two dozen eggs to the hospital. And I'm thinking, what am I bringing eggs to the hospital for? This makes no sense. But I go, I go get two dozen eggs and bring him there. And the smile on my brother's face is huge. A specialist has come in, a different doctor from the day before. The day before... In Indiana, after 20 weeks, you have to have a funeral for your child after 20 weeks for insurance purposes. And so they had called the funeral home. They had begun to make funeral arrangements for their child. And I get there, and I give my brother these eggs. Here's these eggs. What's this about? The specialist is standing there talking. He said, my wife has been texting me the whole time, telling me to bring home two dozen eggs from the hospital. And he said... <laughs> So my brother brought him two dozen eggs because he said, this guy gave me some good news. He said, I checked it out. I ran an ultrasound. Your baby's fine. I don't know why. I don't know why he thought that. Maybe there was a misunderstanding. But your baby's fine. And you need to lay here. You just need to rest. You need to be on bed rest. And there were tears of joy. My brother's crying. Mom and dad come and they're crying. Everybody's crying. What do you think they did after they heard that good news? We pray. We pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for answered prayers. And you know, that's what Hannah does. As we turn to the next page in the chapter, chapter 19 and verse 2. Or verse, chapter 1, verse 19 to chapter 2. It says, They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord, and they returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. I love that phrase, the Lord remembered her. Don't think that your prayers are falling on deaf ears. The Lord hears. 
the Lord remembered her. And so it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked for him from the Lord. Now the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. See, Hannah had made a promise, right? Lord, if you bless me with a child, I will give him to your service for all the days of his life. So Elkanah, her husband, said, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. Keep your promise, Elkanah is saying. And the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bulls, one ephah of flour, a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. They slaughtered a bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. And therefore I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshiped the Lord there. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies. Do you think that's a little nudge at Penina, by the way? I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord. There is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. It is easy for some to pray in time of need, right? Is this your natural response? Many cases, if you're someone who's been raised as a godly person, you know what, what God calls you to do. It's very natural sometimes to just respond in prayer. Sometimes tearful prayer and weeping prayer and prayer and anguish, but we respond in prayer. When tragedy hits, we respond in prayer many times. When, when the planes flew into the Twin Towers, what was the response of our nation collectively? The response was, was prayer. When sometimes we have church problems, church, what, what's the response? What should it be? It's prayer. When we're struggling with marriage problems, when we've made mistakes that have affected our marriage, affected our influence with our children, affected our relationship with others, what should be our response? Our response is prayer. Well, let me tell you, when those prayers get answered, when the dust settles, when everything gets better, when your marriage is reunited, when your relationships have been restored, when things are peace and, and full of peace and calm, do you still remember to pray to thank God in times of blessing? It's interesting, isn't it, as you think of 911, how the churches were full the weekend after. And then a year later, when they took attendance at churches on the exact same day, a year after, everything was right back to where it was. Sometimes our reaction in trial is we turn to prayer, but what is your reaction in times of blessing? Is it still to pray and to thank God? Hannah had gone childless for a long time. God blesses her with a son, Samuel. When she first offered her prayer, she made a promise. She made a vow. She didn't forget it. She didn't relent. And, and there's a lesson there for us. If you make a promise to God in prayer, God, please answer this prayer, and, and I will be this. I will do this. Then you'd better keep your promise. In Numbers chapter 30, notice the importance of vows as we read about it in our Old Testaments. If a man makes a vow, chapter 30, verse 2, to the Lord, or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. A vow was a serious thing. Hannah had made a vow, and she needed to keep it. Elkanah encourages her to keep it. In Deuteronomy, chapter 23, vows are mentioned several times in Old Testament Scripture. 
But in chapter 23 and verse 23, that which is gone from your lips you shall keep and perform. You voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. If you make a vow, you need to keep it. The book of Ecclesiastes, even Solomon, speaks of the importance of vows. He says in verse 4, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it. He has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. It is better not to vow than to vow and not pay. You make a vow. You make a promise. Keep that promise. And you know, she doesn't act grudgingly as she keeps it. She has this child, and as soon as the child is weaned and able to be lent to the Lord, <clears throat> she gives her child to the work of the Lord as she has promised. And in chapter 2, we see her offering thanks to God that she had the opportunity to do so. My heart, she says, rejoices in the Lord as she prays. Because of God, I believe Hannah had a foundation she had a foundation through the storms, and it led her to real and to lasting joy. And you know, the awesome thing about Hannah is this. She would receive additional blessings from the Lord, too. This wasn't her first and only child. Look at verse 18. It says, Samuel ministered before the Lord. Hannah gives Samuel to work in the Lord's kingdom, works under Eli. Samuel ministered before the Lord, even as a child, wearing a linen ephod, and his mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Because he was given to the Lord doesn't mean that Hannah gave up on him. She still comes and checks on him. She still comes and cares for him. It says in 20, Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, The Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that was given to the Lord. And they would go to their own home. And verse 21 says, The Lord visited Hannah. So she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Additional blessings are given. <clears throat> she has more children. How easy can it become in times of success to forget God and the ones that he has placed in our lives, which are really answers to our prayers? And so this lesson is an encouragement to be prayerful when you're provoked. But it's also to be prayerful in pleasure and in times of blessing. As we read the New Testament scriptures, we have some lessons on this. For example, in Matthew 15, Jesus comes across some scribes and Pharisees who are trying to accuse him of some things. And he responds to them in verse 3 and says, Why do you transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother. He who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father and mother. So you've made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Here's what some of these men were doing. Well, mom and dad, I would take care of you. I would help you. But what I'm going to do with the money I was going to use to take care of you, I'm just going to give it as an offering to God and... Now I, I can't afford to help you. Jesus says, you have transgressed the commandment of God. That's your tradition. Just because you give some money to God doesn't relieve you from the responsibility of helping your parents. And you should. You know why? It's an act of thankfulness for all of the blessings that they gave you while they were raising you. You return the favor in their old age. Jesus says, it's wrong for you not to honor your father and mother as they get older. It's a lack of thankfulness. Don't forget who blessed you and return the blessing. In Genesis 41, do you remember Joseph interprets the dream of the baker and the butler in this story of Joseph? And the news for the baker is not very positive, but the news for the butler is. And Joseph asks one thing of the butler. He says, when you get there and you start working for Pharaoh again, would you please mention something about me? Several years go by, and you know what? The chief butler says to Pharaoh, I remember my faults this day. You know what he forgot? In all of the excitement of getting promoted back to his job and pulled back out of prison, a great blessing in and of itself, I forgot to offer a sense of gratitude to Joseph for what he'd done for me. I never gave him the thanks that he deserved. And so then he tells Pharaoh about Joseph. Providential maybe, but a lack of gratitude on, that, on the part of the butler. And then there's this story in Luke chapter 17, where Jesus enters a certain village and ten men meet him who are lepers. Imagine having leprosy 
skin disease. People had to stay far away from you. You had to cry out when people came near, unclean, unclean, I'm a leper, stay away because it's a contagious disease and <clears throat> there's no cure for it at this time. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Look at them. In a time of trial, of great grief and affliction, they're willing to cry out to Jesus, help us. Can you see that we're lepers? Can you see that we've been isolated from every, everyone else? Can you see our condition? And when Jesus saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Jesus answers their request and their prayer. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. Now what's wrong with that phrase? One of them. What's wrong is that 10 people were healed and only one person gave time to give thanks. And he was a Samaritan, the text says. So Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? Where are the nine? What's the lesson Jesus is teaching here? When God answers your prayers, give thanks. That's a part of acceptable prayer. Give thanks. How many times has God taken care of us through our despair and we forget to offer a prayer of thanks to the one that we begged to help us? Give thanks. Prayer is not just a time for petitions. It's a time for praise. It's a time for thanks. First Timothy 2 says, I exhort first of all that supplications, that is God supply my need, prayers, intercessions, that's I'm going to pray for someone else on their behalf and giving of thanks. That's a part of prayer. Be made for all men. For kings. Are you thankful for the blessings that your government gives you? How many times do we spend time complaining about things and not being thankful for the blessings that we have living in this country? Amen. The freedoms that we, that we enjoy living in this country. The opportunity to worship that we have living in this country. Be thankful for kings, for all who are in authority, because they help us lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Do your prayers include a steady diet of thanks to our living God? When you're in times of trouble, maybe what we do is we ourselves go to the Lord in prayer. We gather our families up and say, let's pray together. But what about when the prayers have been answered? Do you do the same thing? Let's take time to thank God, kids. Let's take time to pray and be thankful for what God's blessed us with. Take the time to pray. Hannah prayed. That's the simple lesson that we learned from Hannah here today. Hannah prayed and said, my heart rejoices in the Lord. She was thankful for the Lord's answered prayers. We're impressed with the integrity of Hannah. I'm impressed with it. Though she was in a difficult situation, she still maintains her faith and her trust in God. She lives a holy life. And I want to ask you this question as you think about her. <clears throat> Do you think that her example, Samuel most definitely would have learned about it, heard about it, heard stories about it over the years. Do you think that her example had an impact on Samuel as she continued to check on him year after year and as he grew up? Because think about it. Samuel was placed in the house of Eli. And Eli had corrupt sons serving in the priesthood. That must have been a difficult thing for Samuel. Here he is trying to be holy and righteous as a young boy. And some of the examples that he has around him are not positive examples. Despite their sins, what we see from Samuel is that he continues with integrity as God pur purges the nation of Israel from these corrupt leaders. Let's give credit to his mother, Hannah, for instilling in him an attitude of persistent faith in God despite the circumstances. And likewise, as we face the trials and temptations of life, may we remember our ultimate example, Jesus Christ. Though he was tested and though he was tried, he turned to his father in prayer and he was heard. And thank God for answered prayers. In the case of Hannah's son, Samuel, it led to the purification of Israel. But in the case of Jesus, God's son, it led to the purging of our sins 
and our confident hope in God's salvation as Jesus was raised from the dead. Do you believe in Jesus? You may have gone through a variety of trials in your life. Maybe some of those are trials that are brought about by sin, by your sin or by the sins of others. But let me tell you, you've got the opportunity to be forgiven of all those sins. All those things that have broken relationships, separated you from God. You got the opportunity this morning to be purged of those things, purified from those things. Those sins can be remitted. If you turn to Jesus Christ, who went to the grave, the worst trial of all, faced death and overcame it. And he gives you the hope of new life. We are desperate when we are in sin for God's grace. But when we receive it, we should be thankful in forgiveness that he's offered it. And we offer that to you this morning. If you're not yet a Christian, turn from your sins, be baptized into Christ, be raised to walk in newness of life, and live thankfully for God's blessings for all the rest of your days. Why don't you start now? Why don't we stand and while we sing?